we can uh, start. So uh, this is the last lecture of the series. And so uh, what I plan to do today, so first there was a request about more proofs last time. <laughs> yes, I will speak more about uh, bounds for uh, uh, about the proof of interpolation formula and how to estimate so how to prove the moderate so how to prove the moderate growth of this fun of uh, semi norms of uh, our generating function f, which we con constructed in the previous lectures. And so, after we uh, prove the moderate growth, then our interpolation for formula will be complete. So, this will complete the proof of. It will prove that composition one way in back and forth and one order will be identity operator because mm -hmm. it, but one should prove something else that's, uh, that's another composition is also identity operator yeah. Uh, yes it's some different question uh, yeah but I think like, th this is this would be important any anyway somehow yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, know to know that the series converges yeah, and that's, that's again, yeah. so and so also complete the proof of the And so the second part of the lecture, then I will speak about some uh, open questions, uh, some conjectures, uh, <coughs> and also general generalizations. So. And so, and so now to prove the uh, uh, moderate growth of these uh, functions which we have constructed. So one essential result which we uh, still have to prove is this uh, uh, propagation of moderate growth property. So, and so it was a proposition which we form already formulated in the previous lectures. I will just uh, recall it. So let uh, k be an even integer, and uh, uh, we have two functions h1 and h2, which are continuous and have moderate growth. the upper half plane no. and also we suppose that there exists a uh, there <coughs> exists a function f which is also a function from upper half plane to the complex numbers and what we ass assume is that, uh, so f is also continuous. And f satisfies the functional equation. So, uh, 
which is, so to say, a generalization of the functional equation which we tried to solve for proving the interpolation formula. Only for the interpolation formula we had some very concrete functions h1 and h2. And so what we have uh, done in the previous lecture, we have uh, shown that actually how, how to prove this uh, uh, functional equation. And for example, if we can solve it in a, a neighborhood, uh, of a fundamental domain D, uh, then we could extend it to the whole upper half plane. So I will remind it, fundamental domain D, it was this fundamental domain for the group gamma 2. This was domain D. And so now what we, sh we will show that if we have such a solution, and if we know that uh, our solution F, if it has moderate growth only in the domain D, yeah, that's for neighborhood, yeah. uh, no, I, th I think now actually now it's, it will be sufficient for us now only it on, 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 on the closure. So if now if f has a moderate growth on D, and I think because we have because our function is uh, continuous, so we can just even speak about D itself, not take a closure. So then we pr claim that. So then, then F has moderate growth on the whole upper half plane H. And during this sentence, if you want to reconstruct f on some other point of set of d, d mm -hmm. it will be given by certain form of sum of values of h1, h2 at some points, and then it will be something like 2 to power some number of steps. Yes, 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 yes. So this is exactly what we will do. So, yeah. yes, again, maybe I will uh, use the technique which was disliked last time. Yeah, <laughs> but story, yeah. Yes, but uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not very geometrical and a, a bit too f formal, but. Uh, this is the way I can f you know, organize myself and think of it without losing uh, details. So maybe a bit to, to, to have annotations, but... Uh, and then if you can do about pictures, for example, yeah, the symmetric set of illustrations here, just formal proof. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. maybe. Uh, but here are somehow, at least I think that for, for many people, this like geometry of upper half plane is quite counterintuitive, so it's <laughs> so sometimes at least it's, 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 it's easy to get to get to get lost because somehow here actually like like well, one thing here is that uh, like when we are moving to the real line somehow it seems like everything becomes very small but in fact it becomes very big and yeah, yeah, no, but this one should be replaced by some tree yeah yes 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 so that's yes I think this is what we are going to do maybe only um, somehow in a formal, in, in a formal way. So I, I will try to include more pictures and maybe to try try to also to, to show what, what is the geometric uh, intuition behind our um, long formulas. And so uh, now to somehow to maybe understand better what moderate growth and upper half plane uh, is. So we will introduce uh, one uh, notion which I think we already used it in the previous lectures. So for an element of SL2R, we define it the Frobenius norm of of gamma is in the full in the usual way. So And so now if we want to evaluate this Frobenius norm on the matrix with entries A, B, C, and D, then this will be just the so to say the L2 norms is if we see it just as a vector with these coordinates. 
So it's a definition like this. And so for us, it will be it will measure for us you know, how, how big elements of SL2 are. R and if elements are big, then they will also move our po we will take points which we take in this fun fundamental domain, they will move them farther away. And if uh, elements are in, in this sense small, then they yeah, then the elements will also remain yeah, close. It's comparable to a parator. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. And so now this uh, norm has some useful properties. So and like one of them is, of course, that it is uh, uh, it is submultiplicative. So, so first, that if you take gamma times gamma prime Frobenius, then we will get that Oh, smaller, smaller. Yes, 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 smaller. Uh, and so also another useful property would be that uh, if we take a negative of a matrix, then the norm will not change. And so it means that it is also well defined on PSL tor. And uh, the last, I think it's the most sp sp special feature of dimension two. Now, if we take inverse of an element, then it's Frobenius norm will not change. Uh, because all our matrices, they have <laughs> determinant one. And uh, prob probably in the future, I will omit this uh, sub-index because it takes a lot of time writing it. And uh, yeah, so now maybe we'll need f a few more. Uh, so now, how now what we can do, we can <coughs> describe uh, the moderate growth of a function in terms of uh, Frobenius norm. And so how we do it, so we and this is actually would be the, the right definition of moderate growth. So we know that the upper half plane it's an image of point i under of the action of PSL to R. So it's even it's so upper half plane it's even a quotient of PSL to R by the stabilizer of point i. And so now we say now the function f from the upper half plane into complex numbers, it will have moderate growth. If we can find positive constants C and N, such that the absolute value of F evaluated at some element of SL2R G applied to I is bounded by this constant times the Frobenius norm of G. So this would be for all And so now <coughs> we will also need two somehow useful effects. So one of them is about the uh, uh, about the slash uh, operator and the uh, automorphic factor in the slash operator. So if we have tau at the upper half plane, and g tau would be an element of PSL to R such that G tau applied to I gives us tau and we take any element gamma which will be in so 
let's take it in PSL to Z. Then we can evaluate the uh, automorphic factor in the following. Uh, so let's estimate the automorphic factor in the following way. So it will be bounded by Frobenius norm of gamma and the Frobenius norm of g tau squared. And so another uh, fact which we will use, it will be a fact about fund fundamental, our fundamental domain. And so what we want to say is that, so now we take any element at the our upper half plane, and then it will, uh, if we act on it by gamma 2, it will always have some uh, point equivalent to it which belongs to the closure of this uh, fundamental domain. Or we can take the group SL to Z and then look at its equivalent in uh, group SL to Z. So this was our domain D. And here we will consider uh, its subset, which will be a so we'll call this do domain by F, so here's point I, and here are uh, so now, like, not, not this domain, but if you take a fundamental domain for SL to Z, which is like this standard one, sometimes it's called a keyhole domain, so here is the point I, and here we have points. Uh, which are third roots of unity. So now this domain, it has the following property that if we take uh, any point tau at the uh, upper half plane and uh, consider all the, all its SL to Z equivalents, uh, then uh, the point which lies in, in, in this domain, it will correspond to elements of uh, PSL2R with the smallest uh, possible Frobenius norm. And so, but somehow for, for our reasons, we will not be working with this domain, but rather with this one. So our plane will be like this. So suppose that Z is a point in this fundamental domain, and we have an element gz in, again, SL to R such that z is the image of I under the action of gz, and take any element delta this time of SL to z. Then there exists some absolute constant C such that the Frobenius norm of GZ is smaller than C times okay <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's remove it so somehow it will not be strictly smaller than Frobenius norm of this element, but at least it's uh, somehow bounded by some absolute constant. Basically, it's something there is this absolute constant C. Yes, yes, yes. And so, and so now what we also want to see is somehow. Uh, If we take an, uh, if we take an element in in for example in our group gamma two and write it as a product of uh, generators, then what we want to control, we want to control for example the uh, 
length of this product in terms of uh, Frobenius norm. So we consider the following elements gamma 1 which will be d squared and gamma 2 it will be s d squared s and gamma so gamma 2 bar it will be uh, image of uh, gamma 2 in PSL to Z. Sorry, gam gamma 2 substitute, gamma 1 has substitute, gamma 2 has upper script. Yeah, oh, no, 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 thank you. So we now know that this group it will be generated by gamma 1 and gamma 2 and that it will be free. And so now it's just, it's free just means that every uh, element in the group gamma 2, it can be expressed as a finite redu reduced word. It, it has a, a unique representation like this. So And the finite reduced word it will look like this. So gamma it will be equal to like product of to some powers. Here e1, f1, e2, f2, and so on. And so we know that uh, all these indices they are all integers. Uh, and uh, somehow all, all the all these indices starting from f1, they are all non-zero, and only the first, only the e1 can be zero. So we know that e1, it will be some integer number, and all the others, they are some non-zero integers. And well, like they are non-zero integers till the sequence ends, so to say. And so now we have the following the following lemma tells us relates so the size of uh, our element with respect to the Frobenius norm and its uh, le the length of its reduced word. So first we know that uh, the length of the word, which will be just the sum of absolute values of all the uh, exponents here. It cannot exceed the Frobenius norm of gamma squared. And also another useful fact, if we take uh, only the uh, initial subwords here, uh, then they will have th then uh, their uh, Frobenius norm will be smaller than the uh, Frobenius norm of the whole word. So, so we know that So, in other words, we can say that if we take initial subwords, then they have strictly increasing Frobenius norm. Sorry? Why wouldn't you expect the first, uh, the first part of the one to go logarithmic? Sorry? Why wouldn't you expect the right-hand side to be like a log? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, okay, so first, I suppose that log will not be true. Yeah, yeah, I would uh, think log would be hard. Yeah, but I think somehow, okay, so I don't think like this, I think this is uh, sufficient for us, but also, I thought that this bound is actually, it's not very... I think it should be first power. 
Okay, so maybe, maybe for a second power is to be to be safe, so no, to no, say. No, 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 kind of yeah, that was the whole idea of this hyperbolic mm. Mm. Yeah. hyperbolic distance and mm. so, yeah, story, yeah. It should be the same. Uh, yeah. Length word, length distance and mm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, maybe yeah, maybe maybe second power is a bit of an overkill, but uh, but I think logarithm will not be true. No, no, I I just yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. Yeah, but okay, so maybe I'll well, I'm confident about this, so I may will I believe it like this. <laughs> but uh, and so, so now we can uh, start the proof of our pr proposition. So. Okay, so here I will do again what we did uh, uh, last time. So I will again so I will again consider this like this. We see that the domain D it's covered by the translates of domain F. So this will be F M1, which is equal to 1. So this will be like M2F. This would be translated by some element M3, M4, M5, M6, and so on. So Mi are elements of SL to Z. And as we have seen in the previous time, that these elements M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5, they give us a, a basis of, uh, of the quotient of uh, uh, group algebra R by the ideal I. So okay, now I'm going to ch change the blackboard. Because this norm of them will be exponent of something. Like mm. More like exp Yeah, it's kind of very overkill. Yeah. 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 yeah, because it's suppose you get some kind of non hyperbolic mm. matrix to start to raise some power, length will grow linearly and normal will mm. exponentially. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, but I think it's about. So like we had like two uh, estimates which are kind of in between, so so to say. So, so, so uh, yeah, but at least like this estimate yeah, will suffice. Kind of suffice. Yes. And so, uh, okay, so now we know that M one, these elements M i, they are. They give us a basis of this quotient. And so what we'll write down, we'll write down such a vector m, which will consist of these six elements. And now for gamma in SL to Z. Uh, what we will write will, if we multiply this vector m by gamma on the right, then what we will get, we will get a representation, the c sigma of gamma, which is a, a 6 by 6 matrix multiplied by vector m, and plus two uh, vectors such that a uh, vector whose entries will belong to the ideal i. And we know that the ideal i is a, a free ideal, so we can write it in the following way. And so now how to compute this uh, 
uh, vectors n1 and n2. So for computing them, we can uh, use the chain rule or the, the cycle condition, which we have to satisfy. And so if we so for example, if we know our gamma, we can written our gamma as a product of generators of SL to Z, then we could compute the value of vector n at this element. And so the formula will look like this. So on we continue till at the end we get an i of r1 multiplied by r2 rn. Sigma of secret of secrets and sigma of product, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, yes, 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 yes. yes it's just the product. So let's <coughs> mark this formula by, by star, so we will use it later. And so uh, now what's one thing for, for our, which we'll need for our argument? Uh, we also need to know that uh, this function, uh, these two functions, n1 and n2 of gamma, they cannot grow too, too fast. So if our element gamma, for example, has a small Frobenius norm, then we want to know that uh, these elements of uh, these vectors whose entries are elements of group ring, they also have to be small in a sense that all their coefficients have to be bounded and also all the group elements which enter this expression with some non-zero coefficients, they also have to need to have small norm. And so here again we do it in a okay, so we're not fighting for the best estimate, we just want it to be somehow sufficient for our pr proper, proper purposes. So we say that there exists two constants C and N, which are positive constants such that for all gamma in PSL to Z, that if we know that we can write, for example, one of the coordinates of this uh, vector as the following sum. So it will be an element of a group algebra, so it will be sum over this to z and delta is the coefficient. And so here s is any of our coordinates. Uh, then what we claim is that first the sum of all of the absolute values of coefficients has to be bounded by the Frobenius norm of uh, gamma, I would say polynomially, and also the Frobenius norm of each of the deltas has to be bounded in gamma also polynomially. And this will be true whenever the coefficient is not zero. And so now how do we uh, prove this? So now the proof is uh, not that difficult. So first 
uh, what we observe that uh, it will be sufficient for us to prove this only for gamma in uh, gamma 2 and not in all PSL to Z, just because gamma 2 is a subgroup of index 6, so proving it for gamma 2 it will be sufficient. So, so it suffices to consider gamma in gamma 2. Uh, now what we will combine, we'll just combine this, the, this formula for n, the, our, the chain rule for n. So now it will follow from our statement will follow from and also from the uh, lemma which we formulated above about the length of the words. And also here we'll use, this is the place where we'll use the polynomial growth of of sigma. So here it becomes important that uh, this matrix sigma does not have very big uh, coefficients. Yes, yeah, so if, for example, if you write gamma as product of uh, generators of gamma 2, then we will know that uh, for us the number of terms it will be bounded by Frobenius norm polynomially. Uh, then we know that the Frobenius norm of the initial subwords it will be will increase as function of of the uh, length of this subword, and also we know that the Frobenius norm of the actually of the ending the ending subwords. If you take the last i minus n uh, letters in the word, th this function will be decreasing as a function of i. And also we know that somehow so that now we know that all the en entries of Sigma of R1, Ri, they are bound, also bounded polynomially. By the Frobenius norm of N. And so now, uh, after we now we have everything we need to estimate the value of uh, our function f at uh, points of the upper half plane. And so so what we do for this is it well for this one to somehow to so now we know that if it <coughs> uh, take a want to compute our function f at some point at the upper half plane, uh, then we, uh, it will, we can express uh, this value in terms of the value of, uh, values of function inside of this fundamental domain d, and also uh, add some uh, e expression which will de depend on h1 and h2. And this expression, we will pick it up from uh, the functional equation. And the expression of it will depend on, of course, on the element of uh, gamma 2, which maps our point, or, or other elements of SL to Z, which map our point uh, tau into the fundamental domain, and will depend on their uh, expressions as uh, uh, wor words written in generators. 
and so we will define f to be f to the following vector valued function. So and so now we see that uh, all the components of these functions they all have so now know that all components of f they will have moderate growth on the fundamental domain f because some of our uh, the condition on f is well that it has normal moderate growth on the bigger domain d but now because our uh, elements m1 and, and m6 they are they give us the tiling of uh, fundamental domain d by uh, translates of fundamental domain f so now we know that this is satisfied for all uh, for for f not at the bigger but in the smaller fundamental domain and so now we can rewrite the functional equation of f in the following way so now the of the functional equation of f is equivalent to the following and so now th uh, this has to be equal to the So now here, what we do here, we write uh, uh, here we use this formula for m multiplied by gamma. And so now what we see here that uh, we can derive this in the following way. So this would be just the presentation of gamma which acts on vector f. And so here from the functional equation we know that this is the same as if we take function h1 and act on it by this vector n1. And the same if we take h2 and act on it by the vector n2. And so here actually some of the, the first coordinate of this expression is uh, the, the, the value of uh, f and this is what we will actually want to estimate. And so now that we know that this will be true for all, this holds for all. For all gamma in PSL to Z. And so what our goal is now is now to estimate values of function f at the point tau in terms of the Frobenius norm of element g tau which brings point i to tau. So to estimate so 
So now if we know that tau it is g tau times i, then we want to bound this by polynomially in g tau in the Frobenius norm of g tau. And so now we are ready to do so. So we suppose that uh, we have found a point tau at the upper half plane, and we found an element gamma in PSL to Z, which brings this point tau to the fundamental domain. So we have tau prime in the fundamental domain F such that tau, it's an uh, image of tau prime under gamma. And so then, of course, we can, ri we can write just, uh, we can write f of tau in the following way, so it will be the same as f of gamma tau prime. And so this will be the same as and so. The first like, easy observation is that uh, this term does not really change uh, anything, that we have uh, control over this one. So you know that the absolute way this, the uh, automorphic factor, we can express it, for example, in the, as an imaginary part of tau prime divided by the imaginary part of tau. And so, because uh, our uh, mm, so right here, right. Yes, so a little bit wrong here, so. but okay, we can estimate it by. Maybe I, okay, maybe I didn't write the concrete est right estimate here, but I think we certainly have control over that. So, so let's just say that it's here. We do have control over it. And so now we just write the second part. So. prime and so uh, now from the inequalities which we have already proven now we can see that actually we have control over all all of the uh, ter terms here so first let's start with this one so so 
So here, because we, uh, our representation uh, sigma has this nice property, we can just estimate it as polynomially in uh, Frobenius norm of gamma times the norm of vector f at point tau prime. And now, because uh, uh, our tau prime is in a fundamental domain, so we also know that uh, this is bounded polynomially in tau prime. This would be. And so, but now we know that we can, what we really want, we want to estimate everything uh, in terms of tau, but we know that somehow uh, for us that uh, gamma is a product of g tau and g tau prime inverse. And we know that uh, g tau is bounded by, co the norm of g tau prime is bounded by the norm of g tau. So here we see that this is eventually can be written and bounded by some constant times the, for example, to the power 3n. And similar story we have with these two terms. So let's look at one of the uh, coordinates, so of one of the terms, so if s is the number of the coordinate and i is uh, either one or two, so, and we have so now we know that we can write this entry of uh, of n as a linear combination of uh, group elements and so but now because we have a bound for the uh, coefficients and bound for each of the deltas So here we also can bound this term. So so Frobenius norm of delta and Frobenius norm of tau prime times. So here we know that. Uh, by our assumption function h1, it also had uh, it had moderate growth, so we can bound it by the Frobenius norm of delta g tau prime. And so now we see that this whole term it is indeed polynomially bounded in the Frobenius norm of g tau. And so from here we can see that uh, f, because, because now we've we done this for any point uh, tau, and so what, we, what we've bounded here, we bounded, for example, here the L2 norm of this, uh, of actually, of uh, this vector here. So in particular, this also gives us bounds for all of its coordinates, and the first coordinate was the coordinate we actually cared about. So we see that f has moderate growth on the upper half plane. Uh, and uh, so 
now what so now after we proved the the pr proposition about the propagation of moderate growth uh, now we come back come back to the estimates which actually interested us from the first place which were estimates on the uh, subnorms of the capital x so this was our actual goal so probably i will not give you all the details <laughs> um, Sorry? In your or original sphere packing paper, mm -hmm. I don't think was there any traces of such. No, 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 no. No, but 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 there because I'm kind of like there we did not have this interpolation formula and we did not want to, like it it wasn't important for us and also actually for the proof of uh, for the proof of uh, uh, optimality again this is not not needed. So this is only for for the convergence of of the formula. And so now, to, f to finish the first part of the lecture, I will just uh, outline our strategy for, 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 for obtaining the bounds we are interested in. So what we somehow... So now what re it remains to show that... So now... So now to prove... To prove that this functions. So here we take the norm with respect to variable x and see it as a function of tau in the upper half plane. So now we have to show that they, these functions they have moderate growths. On the upper half plane. Upper half plane in coordinate x when we put index of h bar because it's hard to follow it's a function h yeah. bar with coordinate x or tau no no growth on the it's an upper half plane it's a function of what x or tau oh on h so as a function of tau okay so i would say like if you take the norm somehow this second variable it will just ah, okay. disappear yeah. so to say yeah because it's yes. <laughs> yeah it's not very yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe like this. It's, it's, it's actually a function of, of tau. And so, so now what we do, so now somehow it suffices to show that uh, that so, so like first of course that this function can be extended to the upper half plane, but uh, this is something we so to say established on the a previous lecture, so we can just apply the proposition, and the only thing we still have to show is that uh, these functions they would have they have moderate growth on inside of the domain D. Ah, this functions without poles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so this is this is the after multiplied by very difference of j invariant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is somehow what we had for it for f. Like how do we prove the this this uh, bound? So first, of course, we use our uh, integral representation. So so use. Representation, so and so with this integral representation, we have, so to say, two problems like we have diff problems or difficulties we have. It is first that uh, this function has poles at the upper half plane. So, and here, and for, for uh, if tau is indeed, it will only affect the boundary. Uh, 
But here, of course, like the way to fight it is to uh, change the contour of integration. So it's uh, the first problem. It would be that we have uh, so poles of k. at the upper half plane uh, yes 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 alpha and beta they are multi indices and these are semi norms on the short short, short space and so but this problem is kind kind of it can be easily solved like this so from contour like this so if we have contour like this we can like to deform it and to make it, for example, a contour like this. And the second problem, it is that also that k tau it, it also has a pole at as t goes to infinity. So uh, if uh, in dimension 8 here it will gr grow, so to say, uh, linearly in, in t, but in dimension 24 it will grow exponentially in t. And of course this is a, uh, seems like more serious problem, but what we can do here, uh, here we use uh, some trans transformation properties that this kernel has, and then we just change integral representation. So here we, what we do here, here we change integral representation. And instead, instead of integrating over a contour which looked like this, so from zero to infinity, uh, what we do, we make picture like this, so it's we're integrating from minus zero, from zero, and from one to some point at the upper half plane, and, and, well, and then integrate from tau zero to infinity. And also like on each of these contours we use then not, not this kernel, but rather some like, different version of it. And in this new integral representation, uh, what is good about it is that now at a like if at uh, all, all the cusps involved in this picture, our new functions, they will decay exponentially. And so this would allow us proving this uh, uh, polynomial bounds on, on, the, on the function uh, f itself and on its derivative with respect to x variable. So probably we can make a break. Yeah, so the last part of the lecture, what I would like to do is maybe to speak about some uh, questions which remain open. And so, and so as we've finished previous part by proving interpolation formulas, maybe first question would be, so, well, what other interpolation formulas are possible? So, uh, so probably I'll uh, write down so the, the the classical uh, sh channel interpolation formula. It tells us so. Uh, it tells us that we can reconstruct uh, band-limited functions from the values at, so to say, the integers. So if you have, uh, if you know this f of, for example, values of f at the points n, and so n uh, from and this integer, and also we know that the Fourier transform is supported on the integral minus one half, one half. 
then we can reconstruct our function. So here in this sense, we know something about values of functions, and we also know quite a lot about the values of its Fourier transform, but we also well, we know that, that it has to vanish in here. And so the formula which uh, we have presented in this series of lectures, so it was a formula which reconstructs function from the following in information. So here it's somehow more symmetric with respect to the uh, Fourier side and the function itself. So. So it tells us if we take a, so it's a second degree interpolation formula, and it tells us if we know the values of uh, this time ra radial Schwartz function, and we know its values at square root of n, even integers, and the same information for its derivative and for its Fourier transform, then we can uh, reconstruct our function back. And so together with the Danila Ratchenko, we also have proven a simpler version of this formula, which tells us that the function can be, so maybe because this is a second degree interpolation formula, but maybe it's, it would be more natural to have a first degree interpolation formula. So here if we take function just at square roots of simply integers, so here it's again, it's a, it has to be a radial Schwartz function. So we take only values of function at Fourier transform and don't take the derivative. So here we see that now well, this formula is the kind of lookalike. So here we take twice more information at each point, point by, but have twice less points. But here we, the number of points doubled, but the number of information we collect, so to say, decreased. And so from, from, from this we also can reconstruct our function back. And so here there is there was one Another formula which the so Danilo found, he found formulas which are, so to say, in between these two cases. And I think at the moment he did not uh, write it down, but he gave a talk at the American Institute of uh, Mathematics last, uh, uh, last uh, autumn. So, and it is now available online. So it's in, it was an IM workshop, 2019, where he <coughs> was talking about the following formula. So if we have our function f and then we take its values, we take uh, integers, uh, even integers, and shift them by two numbers, so to say, alpha and beta. And so alpha and beta, they can be, they are some uh, re real numbers, and they belong to some interval which will depend on a dimension. So for example, for fixed dimension, they cannot be too big. And so the same information about the Fourier transform. And then considering such an uh, uh, such an interpolation formula, it also leads to a nice functional equation which can be solved explicitly uh, in terms of uh, um, hypergeometric functions. And so now you see that if you take alpha and beta equal here, then we get somehow this 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 formula. Or we can go from square root of three and get two <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but somehow like with actually like what, what we see from functional equations that if we take uh, higher derivatives, somehow things break break down. We don't, like this is the functional equations we get, they, they, they don't lead to such nice uh, representations. So either the group which is involved is not discrete or the representation has, for example, uh, infinite uh, co dim infinite dimension, so the, rather the 
ideal which we get from functional equation that has infinite co-dimensions. So uh, on the other hand, somehow I think what is not uh, impossible is that maybe if, if we do take other sequences, we also should get formulas of this kind. So and so here and later I will So the question, so for which sequences alpha n and beta n so the sequences of some for example non-negative real numbers So then the radial function can be determined by its values at this point. For example, is it possible that if we take, for example, like density of these points is uh, big enough, then we will always get, for example, some kind of interpolation formula, maybe not without uh, explicitly knowing the functions, but at least... Uh, uh, no, but in this situation, you get really isomorphism between fast decaying sequences up in maybe finite dimensional space and yeah. short space. And that's actually it's another question. Because it's not under pressure form, but going back from if you if you have a sequence, or like we go going from sequence to function, or what was no, the no, question? Go from function to sequence to function, you get uh, the same function, but yeah. you don't get zero. Yes, yeah, so I think actually, yeah. like, 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 like you will not. Like, so yeah, no, the, the is still yeah, I think like you don't get zero because like because our like functions in the polating basis, they are like they are. Nice. The, yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so the, but, but this is actually what we prove in our paper that it, it is indeed a basis, and also that somehow. Okay, so why it doesn't vanish? I think it's more or less uh, clear. It's because it has this like values at the prescribed points, right? So if if you somehow if you no, it's not clear. No, it's, a, it's really kind of delicate question. Uh, uh, no, no, but but okay. So if you have like a. Well, like we have, like we have five, like one, five, like so maybe let's forget about like second order interpolation. Just we have, we have, we have, we have functions. functions and each of the basis of functions, and each of the functions is, for example, like uh, nth function. There's one at nth point and zero everywhere else. And then if we have, for example, convergence, if we know that the sum of such functions with some coefficients converges, then we will we'll get something which will have exactly this value at this no, point. No, 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 the question. Suppose we have a function which vanishes exactly. with something. Ah, so, so whether it can vanish at all the points? Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's actually like in, it's actually it's, it's was something what we prove in our paper that this cannot happen. Yeah, that we that it, there there is a uniqueness that it ca it cannot vanish. Uh, yeah, so, so the question is also like now about what what if we take our <coughs> other uh, re 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 real numbers uh, like this. And, and yeah, it's actually like this, uh, qu what you're talking about, the, this uh, qu question of whether it's a basis or not. So it's, so, so it's also deduced from this like nice analytic uh, properties of the generating function f. And okay, so now, uh, so, yeah, so the question was whether yeah, w w whether uh, this would make sense. And so here, like for, for this question, for example, uh, about the dimension, he, because if we're speaking about radial functions, so he, for example, this question dimension d, it shouldn't be an integer n number, because here we can just, uh, like we use dimension only to define the Fourier transform. So for example, we can think about real, uh, of course, they're not dimensions, but it's like real, this quasi dimensions and then it just means that our Fourier transform is a certain Bessel transform with this parameter d. And uh, 
And so, of course, uh, another uh, question which your mind opens, so what's about universal optimality and other dimensions? obvious way to deform your uh, interpolation formula to 8.001 dimensional space or? Uh, okay, so this was actually also like one of the uh, things we discussed in this uh, uh, workshop, like what we did, we computed kind of like a derivative close to our like ar around 8 what would uh, and it turns out that actually derivatives are also some nice because because the location of like for the derivative so to say the location of poles is still nice, so the derivative also has some nice uh, pro properties, like there, there, there is where you can see some like n nice numbers which are either algebraic numbers or some like, I don't know, numbers you can express in terms of pi, in terms of logarithms of rational numbers. So you're s if I understand, maybe I don't understand, you're saying that sort of it in 8.001 dimensional Space, you expect the interpolation formulas to involve square root of 2n and these nice numbers? No, 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 it's that like, okay, so it's that they have to move them a little bit, each of the points a little bit, but then like how, how much you, you, you use them, it will be this delta multiplied by some nice numbers, like, at least in the, like, at least if you are very close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the physics said for decades, many decades, to dimensional regularization. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> So what happens with so like other question is what happens with uh, universal optimality and other dimensions, and so uh, here if uh, so, so one thing is that uh, so as we've seen for example at one example good example for this is dimension three, so like in dimension three we certainly know that we don't have uh, universal optimality because we try to solve different optimization problems, at least not for, for this, like, not for natural class of uh, functions. So we try to solve different optimization problems and we get different results. And similar situation actually happens also in other uh, small dimensions uh, we can work with. So it is somehow, so, so when probably the so universal optimality might not universally Optimal configurations. So they might not exist So somehow we, we don't really know of course about all of them, but yeah, somehow I don't have much hope that in some very big dimension such a configuration would happen. So they might not exist in dimensions. which are not in our like, list of four good dimensions, which are 1, 2, and 24. And dimension 2 is still mystery. Uh, yes, the dimension 2 is still mystery. So it's like a lot of numerical evidence, but also no, no proof yet. So on the other hand, so again, so if you do this uh, kind of like dimension regression and so what we might do here, we might forget about actual physical configurations, but instead we might talk about this, about the distributions. So the universal optimality of of, so to say, radial distributions. And so here it seems that actually like this uh, four dimensions, uh, they are not so special anymore. It seems like here they, they are in, in line family of with other dimensions and behavior here is not much different from behavior uh, everywhere else. And so here's the something which we 
already discussed a little bit last time. So what we can do, we can, for example, consider this uh, such a distributions. So other, okay, so, so, so it would be probably, uh, so what I really wanted not to be not just a temporary distribution, but maybe a distribution which is defined on continuous functions. So, uh, and so, For example, want it to be of this form, so, so maybe some linear combination of delta functions, and here omega i is in R, and so what we also want, I want it uh, to have a these functions to have a Fourier transform, and so so Fourier transform is also it also Fourier transform, so to say, at zero also has to be one which will replace the condition of our, uh, of the configuration ha having density one. So it means that like if this function, it, uh, this uh, Fourier transform of, uh, sorry? Three dimension is not necessarily the number, it's a second. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so here it's somehow, okay, so, so in this question it seems like dimension should not really be a, uh, real uh, it could be actually a real number. Okay, so um, okay, it was complex. It's not, I'm not sure that the tr integral transforms will be still nice behaved here. And so what we want somehow the optimization problem which we have is like this. It is that we now we want that, like we want the, uh, for example, we fix again our parameter alpha and we watch want such a sum. To be minimal. So this would be an an analog of this Gaussian energy minimization in real dimensions. So, and so what somehow uh, the numerical evidence we have is they suggest the following that. And universal permits to use independent life. Yeah, yeah, so for like for, yes, so, so but here we just consider a problem like this, so alpha is. Um, is fixed. So for each alpha we have a d different problem. And so it seems like the following is true, so the for, for fixed, that for a fixed dimension D, the optimal solution mu exists and also it does not depend on on alpha and so so we have the uh, serious numerical evidence for this. Henry Cohn did a lot of uh, com computations for different uh, uh, dimensions, like taking real dimensions or very big dimensions, and this seems like it seems like it works at least numerically. And so, so we have numerical evidence for this. And also, what is a, it also seems like this optimal nodes R i. They seem to have no no good arithmetic properties. Come again for some kind of model of forms, or with some strange. Yeah, so in a sense, like they're not periodic because this uh, this are just some real uh, the optimal ah, nodes. So they're just some problem. real numbers, and it's uh, for, for, for because of this. Okay, of course, it's possible still to form generating series with these exponents, for example. But then it will be some. It will be. It will give us some function on the upper half plane, but it will not be. No, 
SL2Z. It, it will, it will, th there will be no SL2Z, no nice SL2Z action on it. So. Yeah, so nice yeah, yeah, so yeah, so probably this like uh, uh, matrix S, like this involution still could uh, act nicely on it, but but then there is no periodicity, there is there is no way to describe the behavior. So yeah. And so now, like an open question is, where is now we don't have that much confidence, but. So, so now if we take these nodes, we could also ask whether they give us a interpolation formula, the second degree interpolation formula as well. So, and here, the, here it seems like numerically, it seems like it works if dimension is big enough. For example, dimension for this has to be bigger than three, or maybe, maybe just bigger. No? So the interpolation formula, is there an interpolation formula with these nodes? Principle maybe we can because we, we know some situation like dimension eight twenty four yeah mm, yes. so that can try make expansion in dimension yeah yeah, yeah, can do it, yeah. yeah so, we, so we tried so we tried tried to do it a little bit but yeah so as I said like we found like good first derivative yeah. and it seems to be nice but yeah then for some reason we think like at this workshop there was limited interest in, <laughs> in this problem so. Uh, maybe, maybe it's, it's maybe some somebody will become interested, or we will f come back to this question. And uh, but I think it would be somehow um, it would be nice to understand how the like to understand the evolution of these nodes, so to say, with respect to the dimension. And also somehow the evolution of. Uh, Weights, because it seems like nodes and weights, they are parts of the same story, so to say here. Uh, uh, F applied to square root of uh, to all, all to R n, yeah, it was a very transformative. Yes, yes. Yeah, and also like a strange thing is that, at least numerically, it looks like all these optimal solutions, they are always sy symmetric. Uh, yeah, 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 but I think, okay, so I think actually for, for universal optimality it's more or less clear and this probably happens because uh, Fourier transform somehow acts nicely on Gaussians. If it a Gaussian, act based on Fourier transform, it's Gaussian again. So if it's universally optimal, it has to be equal on both sides. So, yeah. And so... Somehow we, well we, we definitely know that uh, this does not work in small dimensions. For example, we definitely know that it does not work in dimension one. I mean, the interpolation formula. And so we know that... Not two for d equals one. And so here is a, because of the following easy fact is that, so if we have so the Schwartz function, even Schwartz function on the real line is, like is, is not determined by the values. Yeah, but 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 okay, but that's because then because in uh, in the real lines, well, the optimal configuration is just all the all the okay. Actually, okay, actually, it has to be like from yeah, okay, that's maybe from zero because yeah, I wanted it to be even. Uh, yes, because like optimal configuration, it's now not this. Uh, they are uh, the lenses are actually uh, n's and not square roots of n's. Yeah, and and functional dimension, but functional dimension should expect values at square root of n. Yeah, but 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 but, but if it uh, so 
like set up the same problem, it will actually give us those spar this sparse sequence because this is the universally optimal configuration in dimension one. And so this, this is actually, so the result was proven, the universal optimality was proven by uh, Kohn and Elkis. So, oh no, not Kohn and Elkis, excuse me, Kohn and Kumar. Uh, so, and so here maybe I'll just give you a small, yeah, it's very kind of easy to see. So here is the thing is that we can construct many uh, Schwarz functions on the real line, which uh, such that the function itself and its Fourier transform will vanish in, at all integers. Actually, uh, even till to second order. And so like one uh, construction which I like is the following one. So let's take g to be some uh, even Schwartz function. And we define f to be the uh, in the following way. So it would be the sine px squared, which will give us double roots at all uh, integers. And we multiply it by the second difference of x. Okay, so g, sorry, g. And so now if we take the Fourier transform, so what will happen, uh, it's an easy computation, but here we will again, so this second difference will give us a sine squared of pi y hat. And this sine squared will actually give, give us now the second difference of the Fourier transform of j. <coughs> yeah, so we see that there are actually many functions which have zeros exactly here. And uh, yeah, so like in, in dimension two, it also seems like those nodes are way too sparse to produce a, a interpolation formula, even though we cannot, like for dimension two, we don't have uh, example like this, where we can actually say that this is a radial function which has zeros at all. Uh, uh, for example, at the all points of uh, A2 lattice, and is also r radial. And so maybe uh, at the end, maybe I would like to speak about some other optimization problems which seem to be re related to this one. So maybe one of them, it's a recent paper of uh, Henry Cohn and uh, Fernand, uh, in, uh, Felipe Goncalves. So So it turns, of, turns out that this kind of very explicit solutions, uh, we can find them not only for this, for the uh, uh, Euclidean optimization problem or for the com corresponding uh, uh, linear program, but also for, for other similar optimizations problem, optimization problems. So this is what the Henry and Philippe have proven. So they considered the following question, which was posed by Borgain, uh, Kozel, and Kane some time ago. So they consider also a fu function from Rd to R. And for a function like this, they define the following number. They call it R of f. It would be uh, the smaller, it would be somehow the number after which uh, the, like, the smallest uh, possible radius after which f has no more sign changes. So, so f of s has the same sign. For 
x bigger or equal to this number r. So how it looks like, it might look like in the following way. So if we have a, if this is the plot of our function f. It's not true. Is, is it radial function? Uh, I think this, this time it, uh, it, it might not be radial, but, but what is important is that it has real, I mean, for, for non-radial it will, we can also give the definition, but later we will can actually consider the radial functions. So we could have a function like which behaves in some way, oscillate, but then becomes something like this. And so then we see that, now it doesn't change sign at infinity, and we see that this is like the biggest interval where it's containing infinity where, where it has the same time, the same sign. Then, so if this was our function f, then this number it will be r of f. Yeah, but it's not allowed to touch. I think it, 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 it is, uh, it is allowed. Yeah. So sign in a, in a sense like, so uh, touching is also allowed. And so, Yeah, so I think uh, Burgen, Burgen and his quarters, they needed this type of functions to prove some uh, inequalities in uh, analytic number theory. So. And also they discovered that uh, for, for this problem, also some kind of an uncertainty uh, principle holds. So it means that uh, this number, uh, R, if we consider it for function f and it's for, for its Fourier transform, then somehow like uh, it cannot be uh, too small, the product of these two numbers which are related to f and f Fourier, they cannot be too small. So, so, so they considered uh, like maybe this would be curly a plus of d, it would be the set of uh, functions such that, okay, so first it's that f is in L1, its Fourier transform is in uh, L1, and also that, yeah, so like f and f are real valued. In particular, it means that f has to be even. And second condition, it is that f is, yeah, so eventually non-negative. And the, but the Fourier transform of zero is uh, non, okay, so it's really transform at zero is also non, non negative. Okay, mm, so now it's written in my notes, but okay, but maybe non positive would be more, seems like more interesting condition. But, yeah. And also that uh, f hat is eventually non negative. Carrots, is this not, so it's like, yes, it's right, it's like this conditions they have kind of so con contr contradict each other. So eventually it means that it's non negative but only starting from some point. And then the Fourier transform of it has to be non positive, right? Ah. So like this is non negative but the value at zero is not non positive. So. I, I put, putting hat in the first sentence. No, no, I, th I think it has, the hat has to be here and no hat. Here, it's like it means like the whole oh, for example means that the, like ah. the in integral of f like it's, it's eventually it becomes non-negative, ah. but still if you take the integral over all real line, ah. it is non-positive. Okay. So it means, for example, that, uh, that there should be some uh, points where f is uh, ne negative. And so what uh, Bourguin, uh, Klosel, and Kane they showed they showed that the following number for each dimension, which would be like the infimum over all f in the set of the square. So if you take the arithmetic mean of 
r of f and r of f hat. So this will be always some positive number. Geometric. Yes, geometric, right? Mm. right geometric, geometric, yeah. And so what uh, uh, Kohn and Konkalvas did, uh, they uh, have computed this number explicitly in dimension 12. It turns out that in dimension 12, it's possible to find uh, a function which is an extremizer for this problem. <coughs> So they were able to prove that a plus of 12 is squ exactly square root of 2, and also found the fu 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 function which is an extremizer in, in, in the problem. And the method they found this function is actually it's very <laughs> similar to the functions we have constructed. So this function it also has has its uh, roots at square roots of uh, even integers, and it also can be expressed explicitly in terms of modular forms. And again, somehow 12, it seems, for, for this problem, 12 seems to be the only good point, the only point where we can solve the problem explicitly. Because in all other dimensions, the solutions seem to be transcendental. And so for, for the extremizer, of course, it will have um, many, many double roots. And for other dimensions, the location of those double roots are usually some, just some real points which seem to have no particular arithmetic meaning. If you like expansion near 12 coefficients, will you have uh, arithmetic meaning? I, th I, th I think so. Okay, I'm, I'm here I'm not sure because uh, I don't look closely at this particular problem. But uh, I, uh, somehow it would, uh, yeah. I would not be very surprised. Probably it's also true if in this case. So I think like we have nice results when the, node, when the nodes are nice, then Many things can be computed explicitly. And you can ask the same question in real dimension as well. Are there numerics done there? Or? Yeah, so I've, I've, I think so. It, uh, here I'm not very sure, but pr pr probably I think they have the quite lo long paper where they do a lot of different uh, n numerical computations as well. Yeah, but in principle, like the, this problem, it also can be po posted in, uh, in fractional dimensions. There is no <coughs> obstructions. <coughs> yeah, and maybe to conclude uh, my talk, I would like to maybe mention another uh, results which, which appeared uh, very recently and which uh, show that there is actually a, a big a connection between uh, this uh, optimization in Euclidean space and conformal bootstrap. So I did not uh, read the, pa the paper in detail yet, but it seems to be that uh, exactly the same uh, optimization problems as we have consi considered, uh, they also play a role in conformal theory. So it's a recent paper by these two authors, by Leonardo Rastelli and Delimil Matsak. That's correct. So a few days ago they posted a paper which was called uh, Sphere Packing and Quantum Gravity. where they apply the same technique, almost essentially the same technique as we described here to solve uh, some problems in conformal field theory. So, th th thank you.